Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for all uh, uh, coming at this later time. We, uh, as you know, moved the schedule today to accommodate the uh, briefing by Admiral Harris uh, at the House Armed Services Committee. And, and JD, I know for the, for you, th that means uh, likely missing dinner, and uh, we appreciate your sacrifice to allow for that, so uh, our reporters could uh, cover both of these important briefings today. Uh, we want to turn it over to you in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, J uh, Colonel John Dorian. The spokesperson for Operation Inherent Resolve joining us live from Baghdad. JD, uh, JD over to you. All right, very good. Good afternoon, all. We'll start with the Syria update and then discuss progress in Iraq. As you know, Turkey conducted airstrikes in northern Syria's Hasaka province the night before last, resulting in the loss of life of our partner forces uh, in the fight against ISIS. In the last 48 hours, those same partner forces uh, in the southern part of the country, the SDF and the Syrian Arab Coalition, continued their relentless campaign to isolate Raqqa, clearing more than 215 square kilometers of territory in Ops Box north of the city, where they were able to link forces fighting from east and west and then back clear the pocket created by the link-up. The SDF also continues making progress in Tabka City, where they're controlling the tempo of operations against tough resistance and pushing ISIS into an ever-shrinking area. They accomplished this progress, despite fierce counterattacks by fighters in the city, as ISIS recognized the extent to which Raqqa is being isolated by the SDF and SAC operations. Our partners are making tremendous sacrifices in this very difficult and dangerous fight against ISIS. They have done so in Manbij, and they continue to do so in the countryside around Raqqa this very day. Of course, the coalition air support has been instrumental component of the SDF's advance into this dense terrain, suppressing the enemy's ability to retain their positions, uh, destroying ISIS fighting positions, headquarters, weapons, and resources. We will continue that support. Moving on to Iraq, the Iraqi security forces continue making progress in isolating and clearing territory in the dense urban terrain of Mosul, despite ISIS resistance and brutal control measures against civilians who remain in the city. Yesterday, the Iraqi counterterrorism service cleared the Al Tanak neighborhood, one of Mosul's largest. The neighborhood was important to the enemy as a command and control site and was a location the enemy used to keep a lot of weapons and resources. Unfortunately, we continue to see reports of ISIS actions to terrorize and control the remaining civilians in the city. As many of you know, the enemy uses the Al Bayan radio network to broadcast to their fighters and to the people of Mosul and despite the fact that many of these sites have been overrun and dismantled by the Iraqi security forces, they've maintained an intermittent ability to broadcast into both East and West Mosul. Certainly such messages are disconcerting to civilians who remain in the West or have returned to their home in the East because of the brutal treatment. But the city is completely surrounded and ISIS is losing territory every day it's only a matter of time before the Al Bayan network is silenced in Mosul forever. As you've seen, the strikes that the Turkish Air Force conducted last night also killed several Kurdish Peshmerga fighters uh, in the vicinity of Sinjar. The strikes were conducted without proper coordination with the coalition or the government of Iraq. We're troubled by that. We call on all forces to remain focused on the fight to defeat ISIS which is the greatest threat to regional and worldwide peace and security. The coalition continues using precision air strikes, including nine yesterday, to remove ISIS fighters, snipers, weapons caches, vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, and other targets from the battlefield anywhere that they can be found and struck with precision in Mosul and other areas around Iraq. And now I'm pleased to answer your questions. So we'll start with Missy Ryan from the Washington Post. Hi, Colonel. Missy Ryan here. Uh, thanks. Uh, I have a couple of follow-up questions on the turkey strikes. First of all, can you provide us an estimate of how many YPG or Peshmerga or PKK people were killed in those airstrikes? 
Um, secondly, how much notice did the United States get about those strikes? And how much time ahead of time were was the United States notified? And do you have anything on reports of any new strikes or either air or artillery across the uh, Syrian border from Turkey into Syria by, by the Turkish government? Thank you. OK. Um, in order, um, out of respect for our partners, uh, we're not going to give out their casualty numbers. That's something that uh, they must do. Um, so we're not going to get into that. You've seen the same open source reports that I have. Uh, there was less than an hour of um, notification time uh, before the strikes were conducted. That's not enough time. And this was notification, certainly not coordination, as you would expect from a, a uh, partner and an ally in the fight against ISIS. Um, and your third question, I'm sorry. Artillery strikes, um, you know, from Turkey uh, uh, against the YPG today. Uh, I've seen open source reports on those, but I, I have not seen uh, evidence of additional strikes. We'd have to circle back with you. I have seen open source reports, but I haven't seen uh, seen any oper operational reporting on that this afternoon. It just, and just to clarify, you said less than an hour notice. So was that, uh, you know, between 30 minutes and 60 minutes, or was it less than 30 minutes notice? Well, it was less than an hour. They contacted the Combined Air Operations Center. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tarek from Stars and Stripes. Hey, Colonel, just wanted to follow up on some of Missy's questions. Um, after the strikes, did Turkey reach out to its partners to provide any further explanation, or uh, did the coalition reach out to Turkey to uh, ask for an explanation of the strikes? Um, we. Uh, we let the Turks know that uh, the uh, amount of time that was being provided for the strikes was inadequate for us to assure safety of our forces on the ground. We had forces within six miles uh, of the strikes. Um, as far as the effects that they achieved, they uh, killed a significant number of uh, Peshmerga fighters. These are fighters that uh, have been very important to the fight against ISIS and then our partnered forces. Um, we, we have not uh, had extensive discussions with regard to them reaching out, uh, but I know that there have been, uh, you know, a significant amount of diplomatic activity uh, between the two sides since that occurred. And just for comparison, normal operating procedure, if Turkey was uh, conducting an air operation, um, how would that go? Well, I, I'm not going to get into exactly what our procedures were. It would be inappropriate to do that in the interest of operational security. Uh, that would provide valuable insight into the enemy on our tactics, techniques, and procedures. What I will say, though, is it was less than an hour. Uh, we believe that's inadequate, and it was done as a notification as opposed to coordination. Thank you. Uh, to uh, Lori Mil Milroy. Um, in condemning the Turkish attacks on the Peshmerga, the KRG said that the basis of the problem is, is that the PKK is remaining in Sinjar. Is that a perspective that you would agree with? Well, um, the PKK being anywhere in uh, Iraq or Syria is a problem because they're a terrorist group. As far as whether that's the crux of the problem, we've identified uh, what we, we think is uh, uh, problematic here in, in the, uh, the inadequate coordination time uh, and the notification rather than coordination are two areas that uh, are just not good. And then, of course, uh, our partnered forces have been killed in this uh, strike 
And these are forces that have been integral in fighting ISIS. They've been reliable in making progress against ISIS fighters under very difficult and dangerous uh, conditions. They have uh, made many, many sacrifices uh, to help defeat ISIS, and that keeps the whole world safer. So that is our position on that. And you said that U.S. forces were within six miles of the strikes. Are you saying that U.S. forces were potentially endangered by them? Uh, I'm saying that uh, 50, less, than, less than an hour of, of uh, notification time is an inadequate amount of time to have our forces leave the ops box area that was identified, which was a very large ops box, not enough fidelity for us to assure that they were safe. So it was an unsafe way to, to uh, conduct operations. It's a very uh, complex battlefield here, and um, we just want to make sure that coordination is done so that we can get these things right and prevent the types of incidents that we saw here, which included the killing of Peshmerga soldiers in uh, in Sinjar area. Question, did you get any assurances at all that something's been done to rectify this problem that won't happen again? Uh, I'm not aware of any at this time. Okay, uh, next to uh, Cassie Mulary with Anadolu. Colonel Dorian, um, you said that PKK is a problem wherever it is in Iraq because it's a terrorist group. And then yesterday, uh, a group of U.S. forces have been filmed and pictured in southeast and uh, southeast, sorry, northeast Syria, uh, in the area where it's struck by the Turkish air um, uh, elements. And those forces are welcomed by PKK flags as well as PKK leaders, posters, and pictures. So for, according to you, isn't it controversial for American forces being welcomed by supporters and elements of design, a designated terrorist group in that area? That's PKK. Well, our, uh, we did have forces that went to check on the uh, partner forces who were harmed by the strikes. So that's what they were doing. They were uh, working with the SDF. That's our partner force. They've been a reliable force in fighting uh, ISIS throughout northern Iraq and indeed have made a tremendous number of sacrifices in order to advance and isolate Raqqa. So that's what we were doing there. So the PK, so you say that it was the SDF elements who were carrying PKK flags or PKK leaders' posters, or were they PKK elements over there? Are you are you aware that there is no PKK elements in the area where your forces have been checking or, um, you know, patrolling? Well, what I'm telling you is that we were there to visit our partnered force. They've been a reliable partner force, and we wanted to make sure that uh, we were there to assess the damage and to assure them that uh, we're committed uh, to our partnership with them as they continue isolating uh, Raqqa. The British military is saying that they have conducted those strikes based on the intelligence information that many of the recent PKK attacks in Turkey have been plotted and supplied with equipments and arms coming from Sinjar region and Kar Karachok region. Uh, militarily thinking, <coughs> according to you, apart from notification and targeting par partner forces, do you think that those targets were actually militarily legitimate targets because they, th th a significant uh, national security threat is coming out of this, the, these areas, these two areas. Yeah, we, uh, we believe that our partner forces were struck in northern Syria, uh, and we believe that uh, Peshmerga forces were killed uh, in Sinjar. Those are the two things that that, uh, that we believe based on what we've seen here. And some of the problem uh, with this was there was uh, 
uh, not an acceptable level of coordination between the two sides and not an adequate amount of time given uh, to assure that that coordination could be done so that we can deconflict operations and make sure that all forces that are fighting ISIS in northern Syria have the opportunity to remain focused on that. Okay. Okay. Um, sir. Uh, with Daily Sabah. Um, to follow, follow up on Qasem's question, there is a picture and a video showing that an American officer, a senior officer apparently, uh, with, uh, walking with a PKK officer, a well-known commander, his name is Shahin Jilo, uh, yesterday, and he, is, uh, he has been a top commander in PKK's armored wing HPG, HPG, and he has been uh, in control of the European uh, command for a while when he was in Europe. And then he returned to Syria, and he was assigned as uh, YPG's and PKK's general commander in, in the country. And he has been designated as especially uh, a leading terrorist by Turkey. And he's pictured, there's a proof that he's walking with an American officer in northern Syria. Are you aware of that? I'm aware that we had an officer go to northern Syria to check on our partner force following the strikes that killed some of their uh, soldiers. And that's what we were there to do. Uh, there were a lot of people present. Um, that's really all I have for you on that. Uh, a second question. The Turkish foreign minister said that uh, they informed the United States that they should withdraw their forces from the border area at a distance of 30 kilometers because there was an upcoming Turkish operations in coming days, like days before this uh, airstrikes. Do you, do you have any information on that? Would you confirm that Turkey informed you that they would conduct operations in that specific region? Yeah, I haven't seen those statements, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment on them. Uh, my apologies to Lori, Lori Milroy, who I skipped over before. Oh, Kurdistan, you didn't, I came up with another question. Okay. My, oh, did I ask you? I'm sorry. Well, Kurdistan, I'm Curtis, with Kurdistan 24, and your, sir, Colonel Dorian, your statement that it's not an acceptable level of coordination, are you suggesting that if the Turkish forces had coordinated properly with you and told you where they were going to strike and when, would you have let them go ahead? Wouldn't you have understood that they're going to strike partnered forces in Peshmerga and would you have stopped it, told them no, don't strike there? Yeah, I'm not going to get into uh, hypothetical scenarios about what we would or wouldn't have agreed to. Uh, what I can say is that uh, it's much better to coordinate properly and assure that these uh, conversations between allies, stalwart allies for more than uh, 50 years, continue to assure that we can keep all of our guns trained on ISIS. That's the most dangerous enemy in the area. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen, and as a result, we have uh, this unfortunate set of incidents. Okay, uh, to uh, Ryan Brown from CNN. Hello, Colonel. Thank you for doing this. Uh, just one quick one on the on these Turkish airstrikes. Uh, so, within that hour's notification, uh, were any of the you said the coalition forces were within six miles? Did were coalition forces moved at all after that notification, or did they remain in place? Yeah, I, I don't know what their movements were. Uh, I just know that there was an inadequate amount of time uh, to clear all of our forces uh, away from what is a very significantly sized area. So we didn't have exact fidelity on where the strikes would occur uh, and not an enormous amount of time to have our forces react. And, and was there any effort uh, by the part of the coalition to warn, once that co warning was communicated by the Turkish uh, troops, was there any movement to notify the SDF partners of this impending strike within that hour window? Well, uh, there's not really enough 
time to do that within that hour window and there's not really um, enough fidelity on exactly who was being struck in order to even consider doing so. So this was a notification that strikes were going to occur against terrorists. Um, you know, NATO uh, ally, you know, Turkey is a NATO ally. Um, so th there's not really enough information there for us to know uh, exactly who was being struck or exactly where the strikes were going to occur. So this was just uh, an unfortunate set of incidents um, and it resulted in the deaths of many uh, forces who uh, had been um, very effective in fighting ISIS. And, and on a separate note, I, last week we talked a little bit with uh, about the chemical weapons attack that had been done on some Iraqi security forces and uh, some of the U.S. and Australian advisors nearby. Is there any update on that? On what kind of chemical weapon was used in that attack, and uh, whether or not any coalition uh, service members were exposed? All personnel secure all classified material and remain in your office spaces. Do not attempt. Uh, I to don't know if you can hear all this, but uh, it's a near deafening uh, exercise that's going to be done here, and I need to just take a quick pause while we finish that. Um, sorry about that. Okay, team, I was getting in both ears. Um, or can I have them repeat the question, or are we going to keep announcing stuff? We can see you duck and cover. <laughs> uh, question again, and we'll see whether we can get it answered for you. I apologize for that. Colonel, totally understand. Thank you. Thank you for feeling the question. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the chemical weapons, series of chemical weapons attacks by ISIS against uh, Iraqi troops and U.S. advisors and Australian advisors nearby last week. Is there any update on what kind of chemical weapons were used in those attacks and whether or not any coalition forces were exposed? Well, um, coalition forces uh, became aware of a chemical attack. Uh, they left the area. They donned their equipment. Um, where they were tested. Um, none of them showed any uh, negative effects from being in that area. Um, as far as uh, the types of uh, materials that the enemy used, they have uh, low-grade capabilities, and that uh, is representative of chlorine and uh, mustard agent. Uh, sometimes I see that reported as mustard gas. That's not correct. It's mustard agent. So it disperses into a very small area uh, whenever these munitions go off. Uh, these munitions are not uh, especially effective uh, about anything except um, creating a public narrative. So they're not as effective even as explosive rounds, uh, but, you know, they do get some attention. Uh, next to Corey Dickstein, Stars and Stripes. Hey, sir. Uh, Ryan actually asked my main question, but uh, I do want to make sure I'm clear on uh, the the troops that were six miles from the, the strikes Turkey conducted. Those were in Syria, not Iraq, correct? That's correct. Um, and then can you talk a little bit about the isolation effort around Iraq, uh, around Raqqa? Uh, how much is left to do to encircle that city? Is, is ultimately encircling the entire city? Is that the, the plan? Um, and uh, I guess that's, that's it. <laughs> More than 8,000 square kilometers have been cleared by our partner force, the Syrian uh, Democratic Force and the Syrian Arab Coalition, uh, as they begin uh, isolating Raqqa. Uh, so they have them largely isolated to the north, uh, to the east, and to the west. Uh, some significant clearing operations still have to occur in Topka City. Uh, that is uh, west of Raqqa. Once that area, which has been a big staging area for ISIS, it's also a place uh, with their main prison uh, and a significant number of fighters, maybe somewhere on the order of 700 or so. Um, once that area is cleared, and then of course the dam is there, 
which is a source of hydroelectric power that's the largest dam in Syria. Once that area has been cleared, uh, then the cordon uh, that uh, our partner forces have uh, continued to uh, close toward Raqqa, um, they'll continue that effort and, and get the city where it's uh, really completely isolated to the north, uh, to the east, and to the west. All the main roads uh, out of Raqqa will be completely uh, blocked and controlled by them. Uh, there um, is very harsh and difficult terrain to the south. Uh, and of course, uh, this is not a, a very hospitable area for anybody that wants to try to get out of there. Um, we'll uh, continue working with partnered forces uh, to disrupt what few enemy would try to go into that area. So uh, the city will be completely isolated and then at a time of uh, the, our partner forces choosing, uh, they'll move in and liberate the city as they've done in many other areas. Uh, how, how far are, are the SDF forces from the Topka Dam at this point? And do you have any idea how long, how much more effort would go into you know, securing that area? Yeah, just, just a few kilometers, I believe. I, I don't have the exact number, but they're very, very close. Okay, another pause. Sorry. This is a drill for the Marine Guards only. Please do not react. I say again, this is a drill for the Marine Guards only. Please do not react. There is an intruder in the Chancery. Lock all doors and report anything suspicious to your office wardens. At this time, all personnel secure all classified material and remain in your office spaces. Do not attempt to capture or interfere with the intruders. Stand by for further instruction by post one. Okay, I think we can uh, resume. I, I don't know if I've got a, a question hanging there. Uh, next to uh, Tony Capaccio from Bloomberg. Hi, John. I have a non-focus question. In the three, three weeks since the Syria strikes took place, has the Syrian government taken any, or the Syrian military taken any steps to paint U.S. aircraft or interfere in any way with the encirclement of Raqqa or U.S. operations in Syria? Uh, no, I've not observed any. Uh, I don't believe so. Um, the, uh, you know, our aircraft uh, are very capable. You know, we've got F-22s and other uh, very capable aircraft flying over Syria at all times. So our aircraft are not being threatened uh, at this point. Uh, and we haven't seen anything that uh, we would characterize as an attempt to disrupt our partnered forces from uh, trying to isolate Raqqa. Well, you mentioned it, the, the price of the F-22 is still of interest to a lot of people. What is it performing over there? It's a stealthy airplane. What kind of missions is it performing in the support of the Mosul and Raqqa operations? Well, they do defensive counter air patrols uh, over Syria. And then they are also capable of dropping munitions, including the small diameter bomb. These are very important weapons, especially when you get into dense urban terrain, because it's a 250-pound weapon, much smaller, and it can be delivered with precision to create precision effects and destroy targets to uh, make the way for our partnered forces advance or to take out uh, enemy leadership targets. Uh, or targets that have to be struck with precision. So it's a very important capability, and it's, uh, it's one that's uh, doing its job here uh, you know, in Iraq and Syria. And one other air, uh, aircraft question. There's been a more concern voiced by the Army about the use of drones in general against U.S. forces in the future. Can you give us a sense of how ISIL is using drones in the last five or six months in the Mosul operation and to counter shaping operations in Raqqa. Yeah, 
Yep, what we've, uh, what we've seen in Mosul is that the enemy is using uh, commercial off-the-shelf drones mainly, but also improvised uh, drones to surveil uh, the areas where the Iraqi security forces are advancing. And they also use them to drop mainly uh, grenade-sized munitions on the enemy and on civilian areas. They're really very indiscriminate about where they're dropping. Uh, these are not really strategic capabilities. They're not game changers. It's not going to stop uh, what's happening on the battlefield, which is them losing, being pushed out of areas, and getting killed. Uh, but it does present a tremendous amount of danger to people on the ground when we see these. Uh, the enemy has used them uh, sometimes where multiple uh, drones have been used at one time. Of course, that is a, a capability that uh, you know certainly will get attention and, and uh, require uh, the Iraqi security force to, to take measures to put a stop to that. Uh, most recently, though, we've been able to provide some capabilities on the battlefield to disrupt that. So that's electronic warfare capabilities, uh, and then of course the enemy, um, you know, is is really. Uh, uh, limited in their tech, technical expertise. So we've got these electronic warfare capabilities. We can't go into a tremendous amount of detail about exactly how that's going to work. But we can move capabilities where they need to be in order to stop the enemy from being more effective. We've seen uh, a lot fewer munition drops recently, although uh, you know occasionally uh, we still do see that. Um, but uh, one of the things that's kind of an interesting conundrum for the enemy is we have the ability to disrupt them when they want to use these. Uh, the Iraqi security forces have turned the tables and begun to use them as well. The enemy has no such capability other than to fire at the Iraqi security forces uh, drones. And the Iraqis are seeing some success uh, against the enemy uh, in using these capabilities to take out snipers. Uh, to take out improvised explosive, vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices that are parked uh, and to just sort of terrorize them. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of the state of play with regard to uh, enemy use of drones and, and then the Iraqis' use of drones as well. Quick, quick follow-up. Have these counter technologies been rushed to Iraq over the last five or six months as part of these joint ur uh, urgent requirements? Um, throughout our tenure here, this has been a, an issue that uh, leadership has paid attention to. Um, and certainly we've gotten a significant amount of help from Washington and, and Tampa uh, to get capabilities into theater to address this threat. Uh, again, all along, um, everyone recognized that this is not going to change the outcome of the battle. The enemy has been going backwards for more than two years. They're not going to be able to stop the Iraqi security forces. Uh, the coalition is going to continue to hammer them with air and artillery strikes until they are completely and totally defeated in Mosul and other places around Iraq. But uh, that's not a problem that we're just going to leave the enemy uh, to do uh, what they want to do. We're going to take their ability to disrupt any kind of operation or to, to harm people away. Uh, you know, the enemy uh, has been very determined, and sometimes they're creative. So um, what we've done is we've worked with the Iraqi security forces. Our forces are more creative than ISIS, I can assure you that. And so are the Iraqi security forces, and that's why you see the tables being turned and the enemy uh, on the back foot. Okay, uh, Sam Legrone. Thanks for the time, Colonel Dorian. Uh, I just want to check on the status of the deconfliction agreement, uh, the MOU with the Russians. Uh, Russian state media uh, yesterday reported that they had uh, reaffirmed, or Russia had reaffirmed, the, the tenets of the 2015 MOU. And uh, I was just checking to see with you all what uh, that current status is. Thank you. Yep, uh, I've seen those same reports. It's very encouraging that uh, they've acknowledged that. And uh, it is important for safety of flight for our operations and for theirs, uh, as we both 
continue fighting ISIS uh, in Syria, and we continue uh, our operations in Iraq. Uh, that operation, um, you know, the deconfliction line is indeed, uh, it has been working um, really nonstop, uh, and that's something that's going to continue. So that's an encouraging thing to see that acknowledged. Okay, um, ma'am in the back. With Al Jazeera English. Um, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights is reporting that um, in the last 48 hours, at least 16 civilians were killed in coalition airstrikes in the Raqqa countryside. Have you seen those reports and could you comment on that? Um, I didn't catch all of your question. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights is saying something. I, di I didn't catch. That's where you broke up. Saying that um, in the last 48 hours, at least 16 civilians were killed in coalition airstrikes in the Raqqa countryside. Um, have you seen those reports, and could you comment on them? Um, you know what, I've seen a lot of reports come out. I don't think that I could, uh, I've seen so many from the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights that uh, I don't think that I could comment without seeing the specific one in writing with uh, date, time, and location. Um, I don't know that you've given me enough information that I would be able to confirm that. What I would say, though, is that the conduct of air strikes and artillery strikes uh, not one thing has changed with regard to our priority for the protection of civilians. We're doing these strikes to support the Iraqi security forces advance and our Syrian partners advance into extraordinarily dangerous territory, fighting an enemy that has uh, murdered tens of thousands of people and driven millions of them from their homes. I would point out that um, more than 2.6 million people have been able to return to their homes since the coalition began conducting airstrikes in support of our partners. Um, and I would submit to you that uh, I don't know what the fraction uh, would be of that progress, but it's probably a small fraction without those uh, precision air and artillery strikes. We only use precision guided munitions. We coordinate all of our um, strikes with the Iraqi security forces and gather an extensive information uh, before we conduct our strikes. Uh, but these are a solution to the problem that ISIS has posed with their brutal control measures uh, on the people of Syria and the people of Iraq. And we must continue to conduct air strikes. We'll do so very, very carefully, um, but those strikes must continue. See if I can get the precise information to you, but I had a, a second question, um, which was, uh, I wanted to see if you could give us an update on the status of the investigation into the March 17th strike um, in which uh, in West Mosul, in um, which there were reports that um, up to 300 civilians were killed. Yep, we. Uh, we, uh, we are going to release a report on that strike. Uh, that'll be done once it's complete and coordinated with all the appropriate uh, parties and agencies. Certainly, we'll want to make sure that we've dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's. We have an Air Force officer, Brigadier General Matt Eisler, who's conducting the uh, investigation. He has extensive experience and expertise. We're going to pause again. Attention in the chancery. This is a drill for the Marine Guards only. Please do not react. I say again, this is a drill for the Marine Guards only. Please do not react. There is an intruder in the chancery. Lock all doors and report anything suspicious to your office wardens. At this time, all personnel secure all classified material and remain in your office spaces. Do not attempt to capture or interfere with the intruders. Stand by for further instruction by post one. Okay. Uh, so General Eisler is in the process of uh, finishing up his report on that, and then it will be coordinated. Um, what I can tell you is that he visited the site. He's interviewed many, many witnesses. He's done engineering work uh, with our uh, subject matter experts in structures. Uh, he's worked closely with our munitions people to understand what effects 
the munitions that were used in that area um, should have uh, created. And he's worked with uh, our intelligence experts to, to review uh, the, the uh, surveillance footage that we have available uh, on this. All those things have been done. Uh, and we're going to make sure that it's a very thorough inspection. We will release it. We just don't have the exact timing on that. Uh, that's something that we'll owe you as a due out. Um, will uh, Brigadier General Eisler be available then for questions once the report is published? We'll have to owe you an answer on that. I know that we're going to release a report. Uh, who's going to uh, be there to answer questions is uh, remains to be seen. We'll we'll get back to you on that. Um, uh, you know, I would point out that uh, more extensive efforts to avoid civilian casualties than have ever been done by any coalition in history are being employed over Syria and Iraq. And none of that has changed. Uh, this is a very unfortunate incident. Um, but it, and it's certainly not the types of effects that we hope to achieve. But the fact remains that uh, there has never been a coalition that's worked more, more closely with partners and employed more resources and done more to avoid civilian casualties than is being done now. One of the things that's very important to understand is that uh, even with the very best technology ever employed, even with the most robust procedures employed, even with the very best of intentions and the highest level of efforts, and that's what we put into this, the people that are involved in this are uh, not perfect nor is the technology. It's the best that has ever been employed, but perfection is probably uh, an unachievable goal for all of us. Uh, our very best effort is what we seek to achieve, uh, and whenever there's an unfortunate incident of this nature, uh, it's heartbreaking, um, and we will dig into it deeply to try to figure out if something what could have been done better, if anything, and to take steps to mitigate the risks. That's, uh, that is what we can and will do. But our partners are counting on us to provide air and artillery support. Um, we believe that we have saved many of their lives as they take this very, very dangerous and difficult task of digging into uh, a very entrenched enemy and dislodging them from Iraq's second most populous city and other areas around Iraq and Syria. So this is something that we have to continue. Um, we're going to continue to work on this, and we will be very transparent, as we have been uh, with the results of our investigations. OK, uh, Christina Wong, uh, next. Missy, I got you, too. Hi, JD. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, Back on the uh, deconfliction with the Russians, um, would you say that the U.S. also uh, reconfirmed the tenants of the MOU? I'm not sure I caught all that. Um, you, can you repeat the question, um, Christina? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, on, on the deconfliction with um, the Russians in Syria, um, would you say that the U.S. also reconfirmed the tenants of the MOU? Well, uh, what I would say is we've continued our deconfliction efforts uh, throughout the past weeks. Uh, and we believe that uh, continued deconfliction of our operations keeps both sides safer on the battlefield. It's a very complex environment, and um, we have uh, continued our efforts to try and make things as safe as uh, they can be, given the very complex and difficult set of circumstances that we have over Syria. Um, it's probably not my place to commit us to anything. That's, uh, that's probably the role of someone in Washington but I can tell you all of that. Um, and then uh, secondly, um, 
do do the Turkish airstrikes in Iraq um, make it more risky for U.S. and coalition forces to um, operate with the Kurdish Peshmerga there? And how how would that risk how will that risk be mitigated? I'm sorry, you broke up another time there. Can you repeat the question again for me? Sorry, it might just be me. Um, do, do the Turkish airstrikes in Syria uh, make it more risky for U.S. or coalition forces to operate with the Kurdish Peshmerga? And, and how will that risk be mitigated going forward? Well, we, uh, we continue working with our partner forces in Syria and Iraq um, with regard to, um, you know, deconfliction and, and coordination. Um, what we would say is uh, if we follow the procedures that are in place and do appropriate coordination, then we believe that we can conduct operations safely uh, and uh, continue focusing on defeating ISIS which is the biggest threat to the region and to the world. Significantly hurt the Peshmerga's ability to fight ISIS. And, and earlier, did you say ops box as an operations box? Yeah, we call it ops box north. So this is an area of operations north of Raqqa. Um, that, that's a uh, that's, uh, defense techno babble, so I apologize for that. Um, that is just our operations area in the north uh, above Raqqa, uh, where uh, our partner forces are operating and clearing to isolate the city. Um, just, just really quickly, on, on did the Turkish airstrikes in Iraq hurt the Peshmerga's ability to fight ISIS? Well, uh, five people were unfortunately killed. These were fighters that uh, were uh, doing their part to fight ISIS. So that does uh, hurt the Peshmerga's ability when they start to lose fighters unnecessarily because of uncoordinated operations. Okay, uh, next to Richard Sisk from Military.com. Uh, hi, Colonel. Can you tell us, uh, did uh, U.S. forces in Syria uh, provide any uh, Medivacs uh, provide any medical assistance for uh, those YPG who may have been injured by the uh, the Turkish airstrikes. Uh, we we didn't medevac anyone. Can I, one more. Uh, Colonel, can you say, uh, is there a concern at, at CJTF that these uh, Turkish airstrikes uh, might have an impact on the, uh, the ability, the willingness of the, uh, the YPG to uh, continue uh, on, in the drive on Raqqa uh, when they're being attacked by a uh, uh, U.S. Uh, NATO ally? Well, what we've seen since uh, the, the attacks on the, uh, the SDF um, were done is that they've cleared more than 200 square kilometers of territory in the north uh, of Raqqa to further isolate that city. So they've also continued their advance into Topka, which is very difficult and dangerous territory with a lot of very tough ISIS fighters, including a lot of foreign fighters. So they have uh, proven to be a very reliable partner in fighting ISIS. Uh, that is what we've observed to date. So I'm not going to speculate about uh, what else might happen, uh, but I am going to tell you what we've observed so far. Uh, next to uh, Jim Michaels, USA Today. Uh, Colonel Dorian, I, I understand that um, 
This was a notification and not coordination on the part of the Turks regarding this, the airstrikes. Um, but did the coalition have any chance to respond at all? In other words, what was their reaction? Did they ask that uh, it be postponed or ceased? Just what was the uh, coalition reaction immediately to that notification? Uh, we did tell them that uh, this was a, a notification and not coordination and that it was um, not enough time uh, to conduct the operation safely. In a, in a uh, quick follow on, on Syria, um, could you sort of a quick follow on Syria, if you could sort of describe the level of coalition support currently for the Tabqa Dam offensive? Certainly, we have uh, um, coalition advisors uh, with the uh, partner force, with our partner forces, the SDF and the Syrian Arab Coalition. Uh, so we continue to provide them our advice and assistance as they advance into that very difficult uh, terrain. We continue to take ISIS fighters, fighting positions and weapons and resources off the battlefield through uh, our uh, air and artillery strikes uh, all over Iraq and Syria, including in Topka. And then we provide intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, capabilities and observe the battlefield to make sure that we're achieving the effects that we intend. Uh, next to uh, Kassim, did you have a follow-up? <clears throat> Colonel Dorian, please could you clarify some of, some of the, the statements you made earlier. You said that the, the problem with the Turkish strikes were lack of notification and coordination, and then uh, the casualties of the partner forces. So does that in implicitly mean that the coalition or the U.S. military recognizes the Turkish, mm, uh, the Turkish counterparts or Turkish partners' concerns with respect to the PKK bases in Iraq and in northern Syria? Uh, I'm not sure I caught all that question. So you, you said that. Oh, you say so. You you said that. I believe he's still speaking. Can you hear us, there, JD? Okay, I, I've got you. Sorry. Much better now. Thank you. You, you. you said that the problem with the Turkish strikes was that the, it was not coordinated, it was not uh, notified with a, uh, you know, enough time. And then the partner forces were unfortunately, um, you know, being killed. So does that statement implicitly means that you recognize, actually you recognize the Turkish legitimate concerns with respect to the PKK presence in Iraq and in Syria? No, we, uh, we acknowledge that there are PKK in some areas of Iraq and northern Syria, what we're saying is that uh, these strikes didn't provide adequate time and coordination to assure that that's who's being struck. So the Syrian Democratic Forces were struck. This is a force that's been instrumental in defeating ISIS in many areas all around Syria. And then, of course, the unfortunate death of uh, several Peshmerga fighters in Iraq. And Iraq's uh, sovereignty was also uh, not respected here. We believe that every uh, force that's fighting terrorism in Iraq should be doing so in coordination and with the agreement and cooperation of uh, the government of Iraq, and that's not what happened here. Just one, one other follow-up. Turkish military is saying that they have tracked some of the arms provided by the coalition to the anti-ISIS partners 
being transferred to the PKK elements inside Turkey and many of those arms from Syria found their way into Turkey from the two areas struck by the Turkish jets the other day. So I know it's understandable that you cannot account for every single arm you have provided, but do you have anything to refute that claims that some of the arms provided by the coalition found their way to the PKK elements as there is a presence of PKK inside Syria and inside northern Iraq? Well, to be clear, we provide uh, weapons and equipment to the Syrian Arab coalition, uh, not the YPG. Uh, these are forces that are proven reliable. We haven't seen them threaten Turkey at all. Uh, we've seen them fight ISIS. We've seen them uh, liberate more than 8,000 square kilometers uh, of territory in isolating Raqqa. We've seen them liberate Manvij, which uh, was a dangerous uh, command and control node for international terrorism. Uh, we've seen very good progress made in the defeat of ISIS uh, by our partnered force. So that's what we've observed. Uh, we have not observed the things that you're alleging um, at all. Next to Tara Cup. Stars and Stripes for follow-up. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, back to the deconfliction line. So are you confirming that the line is open and operating? And when was the last time that uh, coalition and their Russian counterparts spoke on the line? Well, uh, we are going to discuss the fact that there has been uh, deconfliction going on all along, but probably going to end it there as far as the daily play-by-play -play on what was deconflicted and what was not and who said what in these calls. We, we are not going to get back into that business. So um, we have been deconflicting all along, and we continue all that. Bars. We'll pause again. Index. Index. Herbie. Okay, we're at index, folks, so we can answer questions now. Just a quick follow-up. I'm not asking about the content of the calls. I'm just confirming that, I, that calls have taken place today, yesterday, between coalition and their Russian counterparts. Yep. Uh, the calls happen on an as-needed basis, on a regular basis, and we're not going to talk about every little time that it happens. The last uh, follow-up here from Missy Ryan. Yeah, just to clarify, um, uh, did you say when you were answering Ryan that the Turks had not provided the location of the um, airstrikes? that they were going to conduct when they provided the notification, not deconfliction. And also, did you say that you had not seen the Turkish Foreign Ministry statement rebutting the American criticism of the strikes? Uh, we, we, what I'm saying is that the size of the area in which the operations are going to occur uh, didn't leave enough time to assure that our forces could be out of the way uh, or really understand exactly where those strikes were going to be. Um, that's what I'm saying. As far as uh, the, the, the other part, uh, have I seen uh, a statement? I, I think I need you to repeat that. There was a Turkish foreign ministry, the Turkish government put out statements from the foreign ministry rebutting the American criticism of the notification process. Uh, I haven't seen those statements. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for JD. Thank you very much for your time. Did you have anything else for us before you signed off? Nope. Uh, we'll uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.